eBird has changed the way we bird. It's advanced and refined our understanding of abundance and distribution of species around the world. To be successful, the project depends on valid data, whether it is being used for research or by casual birders learning about rare birds. To review the tens of thousands of records that get submitted every day, eBird depends on a group of volunteer reviewers to make a decision about any records that get flagged by filters, deciding if it should be considered valid or not. I'm Doug Hitchcock. My goal is to get the most people to see the most birds, and in this video I'm going to discuss how the eBird review process works. I'll give you a behind-the-scenes look at some of the reviewer tools and talk about why some of your records get accepted and others might not. Let's start by looking at this process from the observer's perspective. When you are submitting a checklist, eBird generates a list of the birds that are possible for that location and date. We'll look at where that list comes from in a minute, but first we should talk about some of the rarity indicators that show up on your checklist. Your checklist will be populated with data pulled from around your current location and over eBird's defined time period. This is a three-week period centered on the current week and over the past 10 years. The area being pulled from is a 20 by 20 kilometer square around where the checklist occurs. If within that grid there are fewer than 25 complete checklists in the past three weeks, then a 60 by 60 kilometer grid is used. Or that'll go out to a 100 by 100 kilometer square, or out to the regional level if needed. Now for these species on the list, if that species is reported on 6% or more of the checklist from that area and time period, then it is considered common and nothing appears next to its name. Those that are reported on less than 6% are considered infrequent, and you'll see an orange half circle appear next to their name. And if the species hasn't been reported within that grid and time period, they are called unreported and get a solid red dot next to them. These symbols are a really useful indicator, especially if you're birding in an area that you're unfamiliar with, and can help you with knowing which species are more likely to be there and maybe which species you should be more cautious identifying. A good example of that here in Maine is with cormorants. We have both double-crested and great cormorants nesting along the coast here in the summer, but double-crested vastly outnumber greats, which are now restricted to just a few islands. So these common and infrequent indicators are helpful for folks that are unfamiliar with their abundances and can lead to making proper identifications, especially for distant birds when field marks are harder to discern. We should pause to acknowledge one big problem that can arise here. If there aren't many checklists within your area and the grid is getting really large to pull enough data to make frequency suggestions, you might see species with flags that just aren't accurate for the location or habitat that you're in. So while these are very helpful, you should be aware that they have some limitations. So these dots show you how frequently a species is reported, but then if a bird is rare and not on the default list, or you're reporting an exceptional count of a species, that record gets flagged, and you'll also see one of these boxes and be prompted to enter notes to support your report. We'll definitely talk about writing notes in a little bit, but first I want to take a kind of deeper dive into eBird's filters that are flagging these rare birds or high counts. I'm one of Maine's eBird reviewers, which means I see and go through all of the records that get flagged within the political boundaries of Maine. I think one of the best ways to show you how all of this works is by actually showing the eBird review tools. This is a website for reviewers, and we'll start by looking at the filters tab. These are all the filters we have for Maine. In most cases, we have grouped counties based on geography and which species I like to occur in similar densities across those regions. York and Cumberland are in southern Maine. Hancock and Washington are known as the Downeast region. Penobscot and Piscataquis are kind of in central to northern Maine. In Aroostook, which Mainers affectionately call the county, is in northernmost Maine with fairly different habitats, including lots of agricultural land plus unique wildlife refuge compared to the more industrial forest to the west. Maine got some of the first sub-regional filters in eBird, separating out a few islands in the Gulf of Maine that have either large seabird colonies or migrant hotspots like Monhegan Island that are so different from the rest of the county that they are in. A good example is how every fall, Monhegan hosts species like lark and clay-colored sparrows regularly, but anywhere else on the mainland they would be pretty exceptional. So by having separate filters, 
we can make the list for both Monhegan and anyone on the mainland more accurate, without causing common birds on the island to be flagged or rare birds on the mainland to sneak through unfiltered. So let's take a look at these a little more closely. Every one of these regions, or subregions, has its own series of filters, which are a list of all the species that could be seen in that area. Here's a southern main filter as an example. For all of the species here, eBird reviewers define within a given date range how many of each species can be reported before being flagged for review. We can look at Canada goose, a very common and abundant species that is unlikely to be misidentified. So the filter is set to 500 birds allowed on a checklist from January 1st through March 1st before being flagged. That count increases to 1,000 through June 1st, since we see numbers increase with migrants returning in the spring. During the nesting season, they are fairly dispersed and that filter drops down to 100, but quickly ramps back up with the larger fall migration, allowing up to 2,500 birds to be reported in October and November. In any of these periods, as soon as someone reports one bird over the filter, it gets flagged on the checklist with this orange diamond and asks the observer to add notes. These filters are good at encouraging observers to make reasonable counts, but also important in catching typos that can otherwise go unnoticed. Trust me, it's pretty easy for shivering fingers in the middle of the winter to accidentally turn 300 into 3,000. Looking down at a species that isn't here year-round, we can see how wood ducks are common in spring and fall. Up to 50 can be reported in the summer, but in the winter the filter drops to zero. So during those winter months, wood duck wouldn't show up on the list of possible species when you are submitting a checklist. And that gets us to species that are rare anytime like pink-footed goose, an old-world species that sometimes comes to North America after following Canada geese south from Greenland during their fall migration. This filter is set to zero all year. By being on this list with zero, the species will still show up on the eBird app as you are typing it in. For any species not on this list, it's usually something that has never been reported in that county or state before, you'll see that you need to tap on the can't find your bird, and search all species to be able to add it to your list. A little different from tripping a high count filter, anytime a zero filter is tripped, the app flags the record with an R for rare in an orange square. This is to prompt you to add details, specifically asking for field marks, describing behavior, and habitat. Before moving away from filters, I want to mention that these have to be manually changed by reviewers. I often hear from birders that assume these filters are being driven by some AI that is looking at like previous high counts or what's currently being reported and adjusting them as they go along, but turns out it's just your friendly neighborhood reviewers manually adjusting them. Also, these filters are not set for any specific year, and we kind of need them to be relevant for almost all years. We at least try to use a weighted moving average to make them currently relevant. Where this really shows up is with eruptive species. Just because they're super abundant in one short time period doesn't mean we'll adjust the filter for that one time. All of these records that are flagged, whether it's because of a high count or being a rare species, do require a regional reviewer to approve them before they'll show up in any public output. So now we'll focus more on the reviewer's perspective and I'll show you the tool that we call the review queue. As the name implies, this is all of the records waiting to be assessed by an eBird reviewer. Here's a look at all of my own records sitting in Maine's queue. It's worth pausing to acknowledge that reviewers are encouraged not to review their own records. But I'm showing you my records first so that you can see this page in its entirety. But from here on, if I'm showing the full review queue, I'm going to blur out any checklist numbers or eBirders names because I'm only intending this to be a way to show examples, not target any individuals. A newer tool for reviewers is this quick review, which I'll switch over to. This shows the relevant information for each record, the species, count, observer and location, which I've redacted, the date, what the filter limit is set to, and the documentation the observer provided. As a reviewer, we need to assess this information and mark each record as accept, defer, or unconfirm. With each of these decisions, we also have to give a reason. We can accept a review because it has been reviewed by our state records committee, because there are adequate notes provided, or adequate documentation in the form of some media, photo, video, audio. 
And this one is a bit more subjective, but if the observer is deemed experienced enough, then that can be valid reasoning. The vast majority of records we accept are as not exceptional, which covers most of the slightly out of season, uncommon birds, and the counts that are just over the filter limit. And finally, we can accept a record because that species is known to occur at that particular location, be it a long-staying rarity or a species that is just common within a limited part of a filter's coverage. As a quick example, tricolored herons occur in the Scarborough Marsh in Maine almost every year, but anywhere else in the state they are pretty rare. So that filter is going to remain at zero, but we can pretty easily review all those records from the marsh as not exceptional or usually as known to be at location. A reviewer can defer a record, usually if they're going to be writing to the observer asking for more information. A unique set of reasons are also listed here, for if the documentation is inadequate for either the species level identification or for the count that was flagged. So if someone reports an exceptional count, like 300 black-capped chickadees but only puts, quote, visiting feeders all day in the comments, which is a very common mistake during the Great Backyard Bird Count, then we'll write to the observer and perhaps point out that it was just a few individuals making repeated visits. Then there are the obvious misidentifications, including from the Merlin app, which Ebert is keeping track of. There are taxonomic errors, like people reporting rock pigeons versus feral pigeons, and then sometimes just obvious observer errors. Reviewers have an easy option to write to observers, with a default template asking the observer to provide more information or instructing them on how to add media to their checklist. And we can adapt these templates, adding our own thoughts or recommendations, but I'll acknowledge that receiving one of the emails with question about your blank can often be a triggering experience. It is really difficult to communicate about the correction of an identification over the internet. I know how people can get really defensive when we're just asking for a few more details. And I can't vouch for all the reviewers out there, but we're really just here to help you. So with more information from an observer, then we can accept those records that were deferred. We do have the option to mark records as unconfirmed. This happens with well below 1% of all the records I see, and is usually because people never respond to our inquiries for more information, they don't correct an error like a misplotted location, or we're deliberately entering bad data. As more people use eBird, we see a lot of folks entering old checklists in an attempt to get their life lists up to date, and these often come with a lot of errors. The most important thing to remember is that no matter the decision of an eBird reviewer, your data is still living in the eBird database. Your records will still show up on your list, and any researchers using eBird data can still access them if they want. I thought it would be helpful to show how I review records, but without making that super boring, I decided to take this 20 minute recording and turn it into a really quick time lapse for you. And from there, we can review some of the better comments and documentation and perhaps some of the ones that could use a little improvement. So hey, that was easy. In those 20 minutes, I reviewed about 79 records and accepted almost all of them. 25 were because of the field notes given, 20 were of species known to be at a particular location, 17 I accepted as not exceptional, most were just slightly high counts. Only four of these I accepted as an experienced observer being the reason, and it was mostly because they didn't give me really any other notes to go off of. I accepted five of these because of the photos that were added. There was a sixth with a photo of a fish crow, but that's actually kind of a, a tough one to tell just from a photo. Two of these were deferred because I was asking for more notes. Then there were a few that I skipped. Uh, two of them were ones that people in the notes said that they were going to add photos, so I'll just wait till they do that. One of them, I actually wasn't too positive about the status of that species at that location. Uh, it was from down East Maine, where we actually have a, another reviewer more focused there, so I'll leave it to them to figure out. And then one was a really good written description of a possible Pacific loon, but that's a review species for the Maine Bird Records Committees, so I'll defer to them and update with the record with whatever they decide. Let's pull out a few of these as good examples to look at, and let's start with some that were flagged because they were rare. Here is a Wilson's Warbler that was flagged. Note the filter limit is set to zero, so this bird would have been flagged as rare, and it is showing up a little early. Which is exactly what the observer noted, saying, quote, maybe a couple days early, and then they wrote field notes saying, yellow warbler with a black cap, which is great. 
that at least rules out other species like palm warbler with a rusty cap that are more common right now. Then there's this Blackburnian warbler. This was one I was going to defer and write to the observer encouraging them to add more notes on the bird. Only writing that it was a male and saying what other birds it was with is really hard for me to accept as is. Blackburnian is actually a really easy typo to make, especially if you're using banding codes. Blackburnian is B-L-B-W, but that's easy to mistype because of species like B-B-W-A for Blackburnian warbler, or typing B-L-W-A brings up Blackpool and Blackburnian. Whatever the case, adding something like orange or fiery colored throat would have helped eliminate any doubt that this was wrong. And I have to show this one. This is my least favorite comment, continuing. This has become the default phrase birders use for any rarity that is continuing to be seen at a location. But you'd be amazed how often people report something as, quote, continuing, and later upload photos of the wrong bird. That is a good time for me to plug to make sure that you've watched my video on how to find rare birds or the optical illusions one, because there are all sorts of things that basically throw us off, these different observer biases that cause us to misidentify birds we're looking for. All right, now let's look at some examples that were flagged because of a high count. This one with 13 blue-headed vireos. That's a nice count and just a little over the filter. This is easy to accept as not exceptional, but helps to see the observer noted that there was an apparent, quote, major movement last night and states that this is likely an underrepresentation. Again, from the perspective that we're also trying to catch typos with these high count filters, these notes are great. One last thing I want to mention here is a fun little hack for kind of organizing your own eBird records. eBird makes it really easy to download your own records, and then you can do all sorts of filtering and sorting to review birds you've seen. And coming up with ways to organize your notes can be really fun. A common thing to do is use stars ahead of a categorization at the start of your notes. I like to use one star and label records that are high counts or uncommon, two stars for rare sightings, and then bust out the three stars for your mega rarities. Before wrapping up this video, I just want to share a bit more from the reviewer's perspective. A lot of people ask me how I became an eBird reviewer, and that story goes back to 2011, and honestly when eBird was a lot less popular than it is now. For perspective, that year just my checklist accounted for over 2% of all the lists submitted in Maine. And now I submit more than twice as many lists, but that accounts for well under 1% of all the lists within a year. So that flex aside, it helped me make a case that I was an active user at the time when there were only two other people reviewing for the entire state, so they were happy to take on more help. Since then, we've added several more reviewers to the state, and I think it's important to note that just because you're a good birder doesn't mean you're going to be a good eBird reviewer. As I discussed earlier, having good interpersonal skills are definitely superior to having good birding skills when it comes to communicating with an observer. The only other point I want to make is this kind of funny concept that I see where it seems like everyone wants to become an eBird reviewer, but no one wants to be an eBird reviewer. Being an eBird reviewer is a time-consuming and tedious process. It is largely thankless, and sometimes you deal with some nasty people. I've had people call me out at rarity stakeouts for not quickly accepting their poorly documented records, and even had a birder show up at my house to question one of my decisions. So please remember that eBird reviewers are volunteers. That means we're not going to be reviewing records every single day, and it might take us a little while to get caught up. Right now it's spring migration, and I'd much rather be out birding than sitting at my computer accepting all of the slightly early warblers that other people are submitting. I hope you find this video helpful in shedding a little bit more light on the eBird review process. Leave any questions in the comments and let me know what you think about this whole process. And please help me out with my mission of getting the most people to see the most birds. You can do that by subscribing to this channel or go watch some of the other videos I've put together now. Thanks for watching.